all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or at the web. VeteransRadio.org is our new URL, VeteransRadio.org. Where we're on the web 24-7, you can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.org. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at LegalHelpForVeterans.com We want to welcome to Veterans Radio Pizella Colston Bonner, who's an Army veteran and after her service has really continued to dedicate herself to doing what's necessary for veterans, but also uh, female veterans and, and those who are in need of homes. So, Paz, welcome to Veterans Radio. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, let's start with the beginning, because uh, all of us have this beginning of when we decided or how we decided to, to join up. How did you end up in the Army? Well, in high school, um, I just thought it would be something interesting to do. I'm the type of person, if I hear something, I'm like, hey, that'll be pretty interesting. And I thought that going into the Army would be a way to partially pay for college. And um, when I got ready to graduate, I told my mom, hey, mom, I think I want to go into the Army. Well, actually, before that, and she just kept saying, uh-huh, uh-huh. And so when it came time <laughs> maybe to maybe you'll, like, you'll stop thinking about it if she ignores it long enough, right? <laughs> exactly. She said to me, uh, no, I don't, you know, you're not going to the Army. I don't think you know what you're doing. You're going to college. And, you know, you did what your parents told you back then. So I went to college. I did a year and a half in college. Um, and my mom, uh, my mom was pretty young, you know, 46 years old. I'd never seen her sick or anything. And she started having seizures and she was in the hospital. And, um, I went to the hospital and I told her, Hey mom, you know what? I think I want to go in the military. And she said, you know what? I think you're old enough now. You're 21. I think you know what you're doing. So you got my blessings. Three days after that, she unexpectedly passed away. Oh my goodness. Yes. She was supposed to come home. And at that time I was going to join the air force. Um, and I felt like after she passed away, um, I wanted to get away immediately. So I jumped over and joined the Army because it seemed like they were going to move me a little faster, get me, you know, out of the city. And it ended up not happening that way. I ended up staying a little longer. But with her blessings, I said, okay, now it's time to go. Well, t- you spent about 20 years in the Army, both active and reserve. Uh, give us, paint a picture for us of what your career was like. Okay. Well, when I went in, it, my mom always groomed me for business. You heard me say my mom a lot because my mom was my best friend, my mentor. And I think that most parents, they see something in their kids, so they'll try to mentor them in that direction. My mother was an accounting supervisor at Children's Hospital, and she groomed me for business very young. She would bring billing home. I would do that kind of work or whatever. She just saw that I was really good at business. Fast forward to high school, she had me in shorthand and typing, So I kind of, you know, did business like forever. And then when I went to college, you know, I was working on a business degree. So after she passed away, I'm like, I'm getting as far away from business as I can. So I signed up to be a diesel mechanic (laughs) for for big trucks. Okay, that was what I was going to do. I'm like, I'm done with business. I had enough. And when I got ready to leave, they're like, oh, that school's not going to start for another year. If you want to leave at this time, we have personnel management specialists. I'm thinking, okay. 
uh, that's kind of what I've been doing. So uh, that's how I ended up jump, jumping into that. Went to basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I did my um, AIT, which is my advanced training uh, for personnel management specialists in Indianapolis. And then my permanent duty station was Bamberg, Germany. Um, that was a course of maybe a couple of years. Um, right after that, while I was in Germany, my grandmother had a stroke. I came home and I was temporarily assigned at TACOM in Warren, Michigan. And two months after that, the military said to me, hey, you've got two sisters to take care of your grandmother, either get out or go back to Germany. Now, mind you, it's been not even two years since my mom passed away, so I'm not going back to Germany. My grandmother is on her deathbed, so um, with their urging, I decided to get out and go to the reserves, and I finished my career in the reserves a um, little over 18 years. Well, it's it's one of those stories of you don't know where life's going to take you, but it's an interesting ride along the way, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it was very interesting. I mean, a lot of ups and downs, um, you know, had some hardships through there because when I went in, I uh, didn't know that there was a clause in my contract that said if I didn't complete two years of active duty, which I did not, it was really like 18 or 19 months that when I got out, I could not go to the VA hospital. So I started having issues with my hips and my knees try to go to the VA hospital, that's when they said to me, nope, you didn't complete active duty long enough, so we're not going to help you. I went on year after year trying to get help from senators who said, hey, it's nothing we can do, nothing we can do. So Social Security had to disable me so that I could get Medicaid and Medicare early to get both of my hips replaced. Um, Had to go before the Social Security judge, and she couldn't believe that the military was not going to help me. She said, I will disable you for two years, and we'll see what happens after that. Me, thinking, I don't know how long I'm going to get this help, I got my left hip replaced, which was the worst, and six weeks after that, uh, after therapy, I went and got the right hip replaced. Still during that time, trying to get my service-connected benefits. Um, And this went on year after year. Actually, it took me 35 years to get my benefits from the VA hospital. So I don't know if you want to move right into that or... Well, go, go ahead, because I think, I, go ahead and talk about this, Pez, because I think it's sort of the foundation that helped make you into the veteran advocate you've become uh, with focus on homes and women health issues. Yes, that, that's exactly, yeah, Homes for Heroic Veterans was born out of the difficulty that I had getting my benefits, the, you know, the disdain that I had from being helped um, at the VA, which I know that a lot of veterans are dealing with right now. I'm helping veterans to try to get their what's called service-connected benefits. Um, when I was in, when you got off act- of active duty, no one told you, hey, go sign up at the VA, you know, get your medical health card, do this and that. They just kind of said, okay, see, you wouldn't want to be. You kind of waved their hand at you, which was very contrary to how it was when we went in. When we went in, signed up for the military, raised our hand, um, they told us exactly what to do, when to do it, where to be. So coming out, it's kind of, I felt left alone and no one could really help me. Even, you know, my reserve officers were kind of surprised that I wasn't getting the help that I need. So fast forward to almost 35 years later, Social Security has helped me. I now have gotten both my hips replaced and I'm thinking, this doesn't make any sense. It's got to be something you can do to help veterans. So this is still before I was able to get any of my service-connected benefits. Um, I was on Facebook, and it's a group called Veteran to Veteran. And in this group are veterans as well as uh, people that work at different VA facilities throughout the U.S. And I just posed the question in this Facebook group and said, why am I an honorably discharged veteran and I cannot receive health benefits? I will call this person my angel. I cannot remember his name, but I know he worked at the VA in Atlanta. And he said, if you trust me, give me your information. Sounds like you got out on a hardship. I'm like, no one ever said that to me. Three days later, he came back. He said, you got out on a hardship. And so that voided that clause in your contract that said you couldn't get health benefits from the VA. So here we are over 35 years later. He says, go down to the VA now and see what they say. So I was, act, I was discharged from active duty in 1981. April 17th of 2017, which is a Friday, I go down to the VA. 
And when they see me coming, they're always like, oh, my God, here she comes again. Uh, you're, you're done with you. Oh, you know, I'm like, can you just check the computer? I've been told that whatever issues are going on are, are, are corrected now. So it's about almost 4 o'clock on a Friday. So they clicked on the computer or whatever, and they're like, oh, everything's okay now. Well, we close at 4.30. Can you come back on Monday to get your ID? <laughs> Pause right there for a moment, okay? Well, a lot of ch few choice words I said in my head, but what came out of my mouth was, I'll sit here till Monday if I have to. So they gave me my ID, and I proceeded to still continue to work on getting my service-connected benefits because the situations that I had, the illnesses, the injuries I had were from the military, and I felt like I needed to be compensated. So still continue to try to help myself. After I got my first service connection, I thought I need to help veterans. And after doing a little bit of homework, I found out that there were like, I don't know how many homeless veterans out here. And I was appalled at it. I thought, how can you be homeless if you were a veteran? We've served our country. We've done what we needed to do. What is constituting all of this homelessness? I'm going to I'm going to stop you there, Paz. Before we get into the homeless angle, because I want to pull out a couple of pearls of wisdom that you've just passed along to people, and we tell them this, they don't sometimes believe us. So your story helps drive this home. One is, we tell veterans all the time, don't give up. Exactly. It took you 35 years, but you didn't give up. So many guys and gals just say, well, they said no and walk away. A lot of things happen. The law changes the first time you got answers or the 10th time you got answers, they were wrong. Maybe somebody yeah. starts to apply more. And here's the second pearl, right? You got to have the knowledge to be able to work yeah. the system. If this guy in Atlanta hadn't used the word hardship for you, it wouldn't have worked that you got around this contract clause because they cut you, they kicked you out over a hardship issue. That opened the door. So you can't exactly. give up. You got to keep talking to people till you get the right knowledge so you can move through whatever, whatever that barrier was. I just didn't want to skip over those pearls of wisdom. Go ahead. You're, you're saying while you're doing this, you realize the extent of homelessness for veterans and, and how unfortunate and, and unwarranted it is. So talk to us about that uh, part of your advocacy. Um, well, what I, what I found out is that, you know, there's just a huge number of veterans that are homeless. And so I wanted to try to discover why are they homeless. And in my discovery, I found out that when a lot of them get off of active duty, it doesn't matter whether they've been to war or not, we're trained for war. So this is what people don't understand. I'm, I'm training for war or either I'm in war as a veteran. I'm discharged on a Thursday. I go to my out processing on Saturday. So you want me to come home on Sunday and go to church on Monday, just take my kids to school like nothing has ever happened? A lot of veterans do not make that transition. We need out processing. I feel almost just like people do that are held hostage. Because you're coming from a controlled environment where you are told what to do on a regular basis. And now you just want me to come back and transition, you know, back into society. And a lot of people don't make that transition. The other part of it is, is that a lot of family members don't know this person when they come home. Because they may want to be isolated. They may not want to be around a lot of people. And the first thing that a family or friends want to do, hey, let's celebrate your home you've been in a war zone, if you've been in certain areas and you've been isolated for some time, you, just being around crowds is a problem. So that's one of the things that I found out. And so a lot of veterans will start drinking or doing drugs or doing things just to try to cope with transitioning back. They may go down to the VA. They may try to go to a VFW or other places to try to get the help that they need. If they don't get the help or they don't get a camaraderie with another veteran, a lot of times they fall through the cracks. A large majority of them are able to come back home, you know, get their jobs back or start a job, start a family, and just keep, keep moving on. But there is a huge number of them that do not. That's what I've noticed is constituting most of the homelessness. And, you know, just getting caught and, you know, just 
like almost like underground. And that you know, that they just, they that just sort of that motivated that. all that motivated you to set up homes for heroic veterans. Tell us what that's about. Homes for Heroic Veterans is a 501c3. We are five years old. We started out transitioning veterans. Um, I connected with different homeless shelters as well as case managers to say, hey, what is it that we can do to help veterans? So we started out, uh, I started out with one home, which I bought out of my own personal finances, a three-bedroom home. And I started just housing veterans, starting out with men. I would put three men, it doesn't matter what branch of the service they were in, in a three-bedroom house. And they really gelled very well together. They felt the camaraderie that they missed when they were um, when they were on uh, active duty. So what we do is we try to find out what is it going to take to get them to the next step of their life, to getting back to being on their feet. For some of them, it may be something as simple as getting ID. For some of them, it may be something as simple as getting their discharge papers, which is their DD-214, so that they can apply for benefits. You know, a lot of it's very simple, but if they if you don't know what to do, you don't know what to do. And for some of them, they have gone down to the VA and they haven't got the help that they need, so they just give up. You know, that's what it, that's what it's been. So we started out with um, actually it was during COVID, and we had veterans for anywhere from three months to a year. After that, they were able to get a voucher and move on to permanent housing. We've helped veterans get jobs. We jobs. We've helped veterans get um, vehicles whatever it takes for them, again, to get back on their feet. So we started out with the one house. We ended up with another house. And um, I started working with older veterans because what I found out is a lot of them um, are becoming widows now. So that's a whole other transition, and they don't know what to do on their own. So I started just working with the older veterans. And after that, I'm thinking, you know what? After they transition, they need permanent housing. So as of uh, last year, we were able to acquire an apartment building. So all of the veterans that we were able to transition from transitional homes are now in permanent housing in our apartments. And we're still monitoring them. They still have case managers. Um, we're st- I stay very connected to all of the veterans. They know that they can reach me at any time, you know, just to, to kind of have that camaraderie. Um, I connect them to other service organizations where they can go to events where they can, you know, just be in groups. Uh, yeah, it's, with other as you say, that whole community uh, is so important, and it builds your self-esteem, it builds your confidence, you're kind of ready for whatever the next step is based on where, where you are in, in the life process. It's not easy to do this. This is kind of the hard work. You know, you start out with doing, well, I'll just do three guys, and all of a sudden it's, it's much bigger than that. Yes. Talk to us about the, the support community, the donors, the, the other volunteers who are involved in the process for you. Um, our homes, all of our properties are in Macomb County. They're actually in Warren. Um, I live in Macomb County, and I've been a resident of, of Macomb County for over 20 years. So just to uh, double back a, a little bit, I'm also a notary and a paralegal. So during this process of me thinking how I can help veterans, there was two gentlemen that came in my office that wanted to get rid of their property. They were in their 80s. They wanted to give their children their inheritance before they passed away. And during this time, one of them passed away, and there was one house left, and he decided that he wanted to sell it. Um, Long story short, one of my friends said, you keep saying you want to help veterans. Why don't you buy this house? That's how we ended up acquiring the property. Um, Since then, I've been working with um, just Macomb County Veterans Services, SSVF of Macomb County, and everyone has really jumped on board um, to do what they can to help veterans. Um, We still are in need of more properties because this year is the year that I am focusing on female veterans. Over the last five years, we have successfully transitioned over 35 male veterans from chronic homelessness to permanent housing. So this is the year that we are focusing on female veterans, and at this very moment, I am aware of three female veterans that are living in their cars. Um, I'm working with the city of Warren to try to get some blighted properties, but all of this is a process. So I still keep in touch with the female veterans, direct them to where they can get food and showers and things of that nature, but we are uh, definitely in need of support. Um, and so I'll just move on to our, we're having a golf outing. This is our fifth annual charity 
Golf Scramble, which is put on every year by the local business network of Sterling Heights, which I'm a member of. Um, this golf outing will be on September 11th this year. I decided to do 9-11 because I want to highlight and focus first responders that are veterans, um, you know, just to kind of get the word out uh, on them because a lot of people don't realize that, you know, first a lot of the first responders are veterans. Yeah, absolutely. So the golf outing will be held at Twin Lakes Golf Course um, in Oakland County. The address is 455 Twin Lakes Drive, Oakland Charter Township, Michigan. Um, and if someone is interested in donating or also um, sponsorship, I can give that information as well. Please do. Give, give us the, uh, I saw it on your website, so why don't you give us the website uh, for folks to learn more about and how they could help Homes for Heroic Veterans. Okay. Um, the email address is homesforheroicveterans at gmail.com. Perfect. And if folks want, that, that is that the best way for them to uh, maybe sign up for the golf outing and help sponsorship? Yes, they can go there, um, and I can email them flyers. If they, they, can, they can contact us there. I can send a flyer to them. There's also another email for the golf outing, which is hfhvgolfouting at gmail.com. And I do, I do believe that that's up and running. I was just in a meeting this morning. I think they said that is up and running. So we are, we're in need of sponsorship. Um, you can sponsor a whole. You can sponsor a foursome. Um, you may have a business where you just may say, hey, we want to donate a couple of cases of water for the golf outing or, or uh, because it is going to be a lunch and a dinner. Or you may just want to donate, uh, you know, just anything to help out with the golf outing. Also, if someone wants to donate, you know, just to help with the veterans uh, as well, they can do that on the website. And give the website address again. The website is homesforheroicveterans at gmail.com. Okay. And um, it's important for folks to recognize that to do good work, it takes uh, support from all around. Uh, fortunately, the community you're in, Macomb County, is very supportive of veterans as a very veteran and military-friendly business community. So you're doing really good work with some help from some folks. But I want to close up with a question that uh, I ask a lot of folks. And, you know, you did your 18-plus uh, years. You, you fought the VA for 35-plus years. You've been a veteran advocate for decades. As nieces and nephews, uh, friends, uh, kids come to you and, and say, hey, I'm thinking of uh, joining up with the military. You know, the question or the statement you made to your mom. Uh, when you get that question nowadays, what's your answer? My answer would be, um, if this is something that you want to do, go to the reserves first. Because if you go to the reserves, that's your six or eight weeks of basic training, and then your school training, which could be anywhere from two to three months, and then after that, if you like it, you really think this is something you want to go, do, then go active duty. I would not recommend someone that is unsure to go to active duty because you're signing up for two, four, six years right there, and it's nothing you can do about it if you don't like it. I personally believe, and I've felt this way for years, I feel like every 11th grader from that, that summer before they become a senior, I think they need to go to basic training just for that summer. You don't have to sign up with the military, but I think the discipline – the six weeks of basic training will just give them a little bit of an awakening of what they need uh, to just persevere on, you know, to, for that senior year, for becoming an adult. I feel like that a lot of discipline has been lacking for years, but that basic training will just kind of give them a, a little wake up, a little wake up call. Wow, that's an interesting idea I've not heard before. Uh, let's oh, it let's put it out there into the world and let people talk about it. But, you know, I, I, there's been a lot of talk about the lack of involvement the, the U.S. population has in securing their own liberties and freedoms. That We let the military, which is, you know, 1% of the population now, you go take care of that. I don't want to, but what an interesting idea. Everybody goes through basic training to get a little life lessons, and maybe it's something they want to pursue, but at least they know a whole lot of different stuff than they did otherwise. So very interesting. Well, we want to... Work and camaraderie and everything, and, and there's also programs in Michigan that are for 
um, kids to go to. It's a five and a half month program. You know, maybe if you talk again, we can talk about that. But uh, uh, it, 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 it was life changing for people that I know. Well, we're glad that uh, Pazella Colston Bonner of Homes for Heroic Veterans had a little time to talk to us today on Veterans Radio. Keep up the good work uh, that you're doing for our veterans, both uh, male and female. Thank you so much for having me. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fossone. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans. And you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or LegalHelpForVeterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by visiting us at VeteransRadio.org. That's VeteransRadio.org. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettle's Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan. VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor. And the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. We appreciate all your support. You can go to veteransradio.net, click on the sponsor level, and continue to support keeping Veterans Radio on the air. And until next time... You are dismissed.